Hello, all you lovely souls who revel in embracing life just as I do. This is Nirja Malik and you are welcome into my world of I Embrace. And what do we intend to do here? We delve into the many layers and shades of my life, exploring resilience, positivity, strength, and the inherent fun and laughter that lies deep within each of us. Interludes from my own exciting and adventurous journey, my personal battles and victories that have brought forth innumerable lessons in my life. It is these learnings that I place on a golden platter with utmost humility for your personal consumption. Hello, my beautiful ones. And we are back. And we are going to talk about phenomenal, natural, beauteous nature. Cheerful sunrises, dewdrops rolling down blades of grass, gossamer winged butterflies flitting endlessly through rows of marigolds, lavenders and hibiscus. Bare back, horse riders majestically riding downhill, evergreen slopes, undulating topography, Beyond the hills, filled with warmth and tranquility, as only Mother Earth could conjure up. And in the midst of all this was me, blissful, unchanged, fancy free and wild. This was my world. This was the way it had always been. From the time I was born up in the hills, until the time I just happened to discover that little unassuming lump growing in my left breast. February 2, 1998. It was just another day, like any other, and yet splendidly special. My father's birthday. The suave, tall, slender me was working out at a morning aerobics class as usual. Keeping regularly fit was my daily mantra. And why not? I had an amazing husband and a pair of adorable twins to take care of, which meant that I had to be twice as tough and that much more resilient to help them create awe-inspiring lives for themselves. Well then, I was just about done when I happened to quite suddenly feel a twinge in my left chest and unmistakably felt a slight swelling, the size of a small pea, assuming I might have overdone my workouts and would have probably strained a muscle in that area, which could have caused the swelling. I decided to ignore it and went about life the way I always did nonchalantly. The thought of the swelling faded out of my mind as fast as it had entered it. February 12th, 1998, I was sprawled on the floor of my house, getting every inch of my well-toned 44-year-old physically plumbed up by a masseur. It was in the course of this massage that I felt a twinge in the same area once again. Instinctively, I reached out to the area and I discovered that the swelling had now grown to the size of a fairly large lump. At that point, I felt it just couldn't be ignored any further. I told the masseur to hold on for a while and stepping out of the room, 
I made a couple of calls to the Apollo Cancer Hospital after obtaining their telephone number from the yellow pages of the regular telephone directory. Well, we sure have come a long way with cell phones and <laughs> the disappearance of all these paper things. After connecting with the reception, they told me that no doctor was available since it was past 4 p.m. Do you think these things make any difference to me? Time and space regardless. I doggedly insisted on meeting one and then the receptionist assured me that a doctor who was away on his rounds would meet me within the next 30 minutes. I have found that if you persevere beyond the acceptable amount in any person's regular dealing with matters, it makes a difference and they're given. So I have always kept that one piece of information up my sleeve. I eventually met with Dr. Stumpf, who was a specialist at the hospital. And before he could examine me, I briefed him on the two occasions when I had discovered the lump. After checking the lump, he carried on his investigations. And let me tell you, he seemed no less than a very clued up detective. I was quite impressed. During the course of his examination, he happened to raise my left arm and suddenly he exclaimed, when did you discover this one? And lo and behold, there was a larger lump in my armpit. He immediately asked me whether I had gone through a mammogram earlier. I said, I had. In fact, it was done in the very same hospital, but I didn't think it necessary to retain the records. I suggested, giving him advice, that if I could go through the past records, I would be able to discover my signature. And I did. It was done on April 17, 1997. Dr. Stumpf emphatically requested me to register at the hospital, get a mammogram done, and subsequently a fine needle aspiration cytology. F-N-A-C. A word that I would not forget. Immediately on re leaving his room, I realized that I had not given him my contact details. So I returned and wrote my name and landline number on a post-it lying on the table. At the mammogram department, I was told that the earliest they could give me an appointment was on Monday. And they said 10 o'clock. And I said, no, I'm afraid not because I have an aerobic class. So I decided to come back on that day to do the needful, which meant registering myself, etc., since I lived fairly close by and I left for home. And why do you think I did that quicker than I could have or would have? My Masio was waiting. So the moment I reached home to continue my massage, some sixth sense got the better of me. I intuitively yanked out the phone from the telephone socket at the entrance of my house and reconnected it into the bedroom where I was getting my massage done. There was no plausible reason for doing it, but when fate has a different role to play, God has an amazing way to protect you. I lay down to continue my massage. When out of the blue, the phone rang. I promise you, I jumped up. Had I been standing, I would have sat down. Had I been sitting, I would have fallen. It was the doctor's assistant informing me that the doctor himself would like to speak to me. The moment the doctor connected with me, he was most apologetic that my appointment was slotted only for Monday, whereas he desired to have it done along with the FNAC immediately. He requested me to return to the hospital as soon as possible. I put the receiver down and then it hit me. 
that it may not have been a coincidence to have unconsciously shifted the phone into the bedroom, something that I'd never done before. Obviously, there had to be a superior hand protecting and guiding me all along. But yes, the beads of sweat had started and all kinds of questions rose up in my mind as I quickly tried to do the needful. I left the massage midway and rushed to the hospital. While waiting in the lounge, I saw him returning to his room. And as he passed by, I said, Hey, Doc, I've come back. He tersely replied, It is good that you've done that. Somehow, the manner in which he communicated this to me was a bit unsettling. Both the mammogram and the FNAC tests were done and the results were expected the next day. There was too much happening in my mind. The kids were at home. So many things were running through the brain that normally behaves as if thoughts are like little worms let loose on a play field full of food. They just run around, run around, run around, creating more chaos than actually sorting out as they should. I wish those worms would fall into line. But then, obviously, they have the better of us. Later that evening, I narrated a bit-by-bit bit account of all that had happened at the hospital to Mandi, my husband. He could see the anxiety writ large in my face and decided that he would accompany me to the hospital the next day. We went directly to the pathology department where the lady doctor turned to me and said, Mrs. Malik, I have bad news for you. You have cancer. It was like a judgment passed at me when I was not prepared. It is the resilience of a 44-year-old aerobic obsessed person who was strong enough to stand and handle the information. We went to Dr. Stove, laden with the reports, and then he introduced us to an onco surgeon who explained the entire procedure of the surgery, which was fixed for the 18th of the month. And what was this day? It was Friday, the 13th of February, 1998. Next, Dr. Ramesh, the oncologist, explained the nuances of the protocol of the chemotherapy treatment and its possible side effects. And the radiologist, guess what? The onco-radiologist was Dr. Stumpf himself, none other than the one who actually tested me initially for this very, very naughty lump. It was almost lunchtime now, and Mandeep and I were returning home in the car. I had been invited to two lunches that afternoon and told Mandeep to call up one of the hostesses and cancel it for me. Mandeep spoke to her saying I would be unable to attend the party. On being questioned for the reason, he stated that I had been diagnosed with cancer. That was when the reality of what he said suddenly overtook my senses. And my reflex action was to give him a solid punch on his arm. My following words were, Why did you have to tell her that I was suffering from cancer? Couldn't you have just said that I had an upset stomach? Yeah, that was then. Only for that particular moment. Thereafter, it was never to be a hidden thing. It was something to be made the most of something to be tackled, something to be learned from, and something to pass on. It was then 
after I had biffed him on his arm, that the tears flowed like a perennial stream. Till that point of time, I hadn't had a moment to deal with it. I had been on autopilot. I just cried my heart out till we approached the house. I instantly dried my tears as the twins would be back home from school soon. And I didn't want to see them like I was and I didn't want them to see me like I was. Always having been a good actress in schools, colleges, having also stage managed Man of La Mancha with Alec Padamsi in Bombay while I was doing my beard, I was, and perhaps still am, an actress par excellence. I dried my tears. Getting down from the car, into the lift, from the basement, coming to the second floor, I composed myself. In the mirror, I placed a beatific smile on my face. And the strength and resilience, the courage, bravery, that had been my closest companions since perhaps the time I was born, nay, perhaps when I was conceived, came to my aid. And I faced and met the kids, as I always did, with hugs and smiles and scooping them up in my arms, simultaneously tickling them giggling with them and it was as if nothing was wrong. So, thereafter, I bifurcated my life on two scores. One, in front of the children, I was normal, happy-go-lucky, the usual bubbly mother that they loved to be with. And two, trying to simultaneously absorb what was happening to me on the other side. A weekend full of a range of vital tests required prior to the surgery followed. It was during this time that my parents insisted that I should actually have the operation done at Mumbai and not at Chennai for a couple of logical reasons. Firstly, because my parents, my sister, my in-laws lived in Mumbai. I would be well looked after by them, especially during the post-operative period and through the ensuing chemotherapies and radiations. Secondly, like my parents pointed out, back home in Chennai, I only had Mandeep and the twins with me. So it was decided that the entire treatment would be conducted in Mumbai. This made sense to me because I felt that while I was away, going through the worst, at least my children would be in their sacred, safe space and not be able to feel the vibrations of all that their mother was going through. A battle royale was about to arise as it was fated to be. When I reached Mumbai, I walked up confidently to my father and I told him very determinedly that I was going to fight cancer no matter what it took. And then he said something which changed my entire outlook towards life and its challenges radically and how. My father, a highly respected naval officer and my Aryan warrior, looked at me in his usual calm and composed manner and said, Bitta, why are you using the word fight? Fight is a negative, an aggressive word. Why don't you use the word face instead? Face it, not fight it. Face cancer not fight cancer. This is exactly what I tell my patients when I counsel them. These are the first words that escape from my lips. Fighting 
is an unnecessary aggression. Conquering doesn't mean that we have to maim, to vanquish. When one faces challenges up front and eye to eye, one can be absolutely calm and serene and conquer anything with awe inspiring respect. I then got my act together and went to war. <laughs> yes, I had cried, wept inconsolably for almost three days as I kept wondering what would happen to my darling twins if I was no more. But no, I was not going to give up at all. I had my twins to fend for and a loving husband to stand by for the rest of our lives. My parents, my sister, her family, my in-laws, my brothers-in-laws, their families. I knew that they would rally around and support me as wonderful relatives, nay, also wonderful and loving and compassionate human beings. Let's face it. It was only a human being who had told me that I had a mere 25% chances of survival and that also only if I went either to the US or to France. It wasn't God who said this. He didn't come down wagging his finger at me and stating that I was going to die. And since it was not God's proclamation, there was no way I was going to separate myself from my darling children and waste away in a country where they wouldn't even be able to join me. With this determined decision, or what I call Drill Nishchai, sealed within the very depths of my body, my mind and my soul, I walked into the arena to win, to overcome, and to conquer. So, face it, I did. Hell for whatever happened. And all through the scientific processes on the path of curing cancer, including chemotherapy and radiation exposures, I willed each cell in my body to cure itself each iota of my existence to rectify, restore, rebuild and each moment to completely vanquish this Hydra that thought it could win. And how do you think I did that? I entreated the divinity in the chemotherapy to completely destroy the malignant cells and to leave my good cells alone. There were many people who I taught this to and still are in the course of their facing and going through chemotherapy. And there are some cases where they openly laughed at how I was communicating with the divinity in the chemotherapy coursing down through the tube into my veins. But do you know something? When they recovered, when they faced it, when they conquered it, and other patients came to them, do you know what they would tell them? Speak to the divinity in the chemotherapy and tell it to get rid of your bad cells and not the good. So life comes a full circle. And when I realized that the very people who were laughing at me but finally felt that there was no way to overcome things other than the tips that were coming and flowing so easily through me without a thought. They benefited from that. And then, like the ripple effect, they passed it on to other patients. And their wives came and told me laughingly, you know, he used to laugh at you. And guess what happened day before? He was telling a young girl going through chemotherapy to talk to the divinity in the chemotherapy. We both had a hearty love. And this friend of mine and her husband 
our dear friends celebrating 60th birthdays, many anniversaries, having got their son married and a lovely girl as a daughter-in-law. More like a daughter, I should say. And yes, let me tell you, our tribe increases. Not decreases. Our tribe increases where we can confidently look the other in the eye and say, if I can do it, so can you. Now, I entreated the divinity in the chemotherapy to completely destroy the malignant cells and to leave the good cells alone. Why? Why would I do that? That is because the chemotherapy impartially destroys both the good and the bad cells without discrimination. It is the good cells that help raise one's immunity and make one less vulnerable to any possible infection. And guess what? Isn't that what life is about? To raise ourselves from our daily challenges into a higher space where we can actually look down on those challenges and feel rewarded that with God's grace and every everything else, love, prayers, and best wishes from the world all over, you can persist, you can resist the bad, and you can be your wonderful, blooming and blossoming self through any dark clouds that come to envelop you. God is great. I Embrace isn't just about my journey of conquering cancer. It's about embracing life in all its entanglement and beauty. Remember, in this journey of life, you are never alone. And I need to thank you for becoming a part of this inspiring journey. Thank you for joining me today on I Embrace and my heartfelt wishes. Stay resilient, stay positive, and most importantly, keep embracing life in all its glory. <laughs>